That Life is Strange 2 should grapple with the political so overtly is admirable, but Paris-based developer Don't Nod Entertainment's execution tends to be a bit broad. Washington's rural xenophobes who spit bile at our foreign-born protagonists and grouse about building that wall feel almost cartoonishly bigoted. Their acts of violence, often racially motivated, feel sensationalized, and lack much of the nuance and sensitivity of which we know the studio is capable based on its previous work. Once on the road, Sean and Daniel encounter a friendly left-wing podcaster who warns them that everything is political. Perhaps. But here, some subtlety would have been appropriate. To begin with, I don't believe that this article is overtly racist. To call it so would be to equate ignorance with prejudice. While ignorance is certainly a symptom of prejudice, one does not always beg the other. A better word for the paragraph would be problematic. While it doesn't appear to be the opinion of the author to rob these narratives of visibility, that is a result that seems oddly pervasive throughout this thought. To give the most charitable interpretation and not be careless with this individual's career and integrity, I will say that this is but one paragraph in a much larger article that praises the game. That's not to say that I didn't find the many areas of this argument to be troubling. To aptly deconstruct the article and make the point of missing the point, I'll go line by line and discuss. That Life is Strange 2 should grapple with the political so overtly is admirable. But Paris-based developer Don't Nod Entertainment's execution tends to be a bit broad. The first sentence sets the framework for the paragraph in that they are attempting to dissuade a racist interpretation of the following analysis. They are making the argument that while racism certainly exists in modern-day America, the way that it manifests does not exist in the way that Life is Strange 2 contextualizes it. While this sentence isn't wholly damaging on its own, what it succeeds in doing is washing its hands of the responsibility that comes with calling the article problematic at all. That in creating what the author views to be a caricature of modern-day racism, and having the protagonist overcome it is, at the end of the day, an ineffectual pursuit due to actual racism surfacing in more nuanced forms. The fact that the paragraph makes several assertions later that are demonstrably incorrect work against this hand-washing technique. In essence, because they try to categorize the villain as not being a legitimate depiction of how racism in modern-day America exists. To do so is to take away the narratives that are a reality of so many American citizens. While potentially attempting to be informative, one might argue that a chief reason to bring up the fact that Don't Nod is a Paris-based developer is to discredit their perspective on the U.S. political climate, using a disturbingly similar rhetoric as the very villain that they categorize as cartoonishly bigoted in the following paragraph. Washington's rural xenophobes who spit bile at our foreign-born protagonists and grouse about building that wall feel almost cartoonishly bigoted. This sentence was written in an ivory tower several stories above the struggles of the working class of the country that come into contact with actual, real-life humans on a regular basis. In some lucky scenarios, these transgressions are filmed and the perpetrator is held responsible. Additionally, they are easily viewable given the viral nature of social media. However, this represents a small percentage of actual real-life depictions of overt racism. While direct racism may exist as a smaller fraction of racism as a whole, according to a CBS poll conducted in June of 2018, 51% of Americans polled were actually in favor of a wall bordering Mexico, with 32% believing that it was a goal that could be completed, and 19% believing it should at least be attempted. Next, the scene referenced by the article is contextualized in a very specific way, where the man, an owner of a small business, believes that our protagonist Sean has stolen from him. In some cases, in fact, he is not wrong. Whereas it is not important whether or not he is correct, his operating mentality is that he is justified in his racism based on what he has witnessed, thereby allowing his racist preconceived notions to be confirmed. This altercation is what, in our villain's eyes, justifies his bile to be spat. 
Last of all, for an article claiming to play the game twice, they seem to pay attention to a game about as much as, come to think of it, I would expect of IGN. Particularly, I am referring to the categorization of our protagonists as being foreign-born. Both are first-generation American citizens. This is said several times throughout the game, and in fact in the very scene that is being disregarded by the article as being cartoonish. The villain threatens to call ICE and taunts Sean by asking if he should even be in the country. Sean responds by saying he's an American citizen. Ignorance of this fact is not a crime, but it certainly is problematic when the paragraph began with the journalistic equivalent to, I'm not racist, but... The scene where Sean is zip-tied to the pipe in our villain's office may be understandably jarring at first, but to call this cartoonish is to make the argument that this is not happening at this moment in the country. Except that this currently is happening in our country, and is a direct parallel to children being separated from their parents at the border and caged in detention centers. I would argue that that's a somewhat nuanced allegory, but perhaps that wasn't what the author was looking for. Their acts of violence, often racially motivated, feel sensationalized, and lack much of the nuance and sensitivity of which we know the studio is capable based on its previous work. Characterizing the villain as cartoonish and claiming that the original Life is Strange had a nuanced approach to its villain is such a strange perspective to have for a series that previously had its big bad as somebody who had an evil monologue about how he was willing to corrupt, murder, steal, and risk death and incarceration because he was obsessed with taking photos of innocent-looking teenaged girls. To the author, do the acts of violence in Life is Strange 2 feel sensationalized because they are topical? Is any form of media guilty of sensationalism if they are merely making reference to an issue at hand? Is any form of media made less legitimate in your eyes if it speaks to any sort of social or political climate of the day? Once on the road, Sean and Daniel encounter a friendly left-wing podcaster who warns them that everything is political. If the argument you pose doesn't prove that everything is political, I suppose nothing will. The absence of political narrative that one might argue the original Life is Strange had is still political. It's just political as it pertains to another's preferences. To put it another way, People arguing that football players perhaps shouldn't kneel during the national anthem because football shouldn't be political is just making the statement that football should adhere to your politics. Just the same, criticizing the visibility of a narrative that is not strictly your own and to characterize it as cartoonish is as bad as saying it shouldn't happen at all. Perhaps, but here some subtlety would have been appropriate. Again, our author begs for a subtlety that never existed. Was it subtle when Kate Marsh had things thrown at her and was verbally harassed in nearly every scene that she was in? Was it too on the nose when Chloe was bedridden and the game literally asked you if assisted suicide was okay? Perhaps the next episode will appease your appetite for subtlety by having a spoiled teenager wave a gun in the air and announce that he can get away with anything because his parents own the town and have paid off the police.